This is the Decoding Obesity Podcast, where we simplify, demystify, and decode obesity, helping you lose weight and feel great. So gear up for a fascinating journey through this ever-evolving field, and let's see what we find. And please remember that the thoughts and opinions on this podcast do not constitute medical advice. Don't forget to visit our website, www.decodingobesity.com, for show notes and more info. And now, here's your host of the Decoding Obesity Podcast, Dr. Avishkar Sabarwal. Hello and welcome everyone. We recently had a great discussion on meditation and how it can help in the management of obesity. There is also a concept of mindful eating. Let's see what is mindful eating and how it can help you. I am pleased to welcome Dr. Michelle Thompson. She is both certified in lifestyle medicine, integrative medicine, and family medicine. She is a faculty of University of Pittsburgh Medical School and is the chair of medicine UPMC Horizon. She is also a physician advisor for Nemacolin Woodlands Resort Holistic Healing Center in Farmington, Pennsylvania. Dr. Thompson has developed a free healthy living series where she lectures and provides experiential opportunities to anyone in the community seeking knowledge in integrative modalities. She has been active in teaching the whole food plant-based diet to people in her community, creating cooking programs with a local chef and dietitian for eating to reverse disease. She runs many programs and workshops to help people lead healthy lives. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be with you. Thank you so much for coming and talking to us about mindful eating. Yeah, it's so, a very important topic. I'm glad that you're opening up this space to do this. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't know the concept. And for the longest time, I didn't know the concept of mindful eating and how it can help patients with obesity. So let's begin by discussing what exactly is mindful eating. Yeah, so mindful eating really, you know, if you know the concept of mindfulness, it brings you into the present moment. And so, you know, mindful eating is just that it's a way to practice mindfulness in our day. And we can we have to eat, right? So we have to eat several times throughout the day, whether you choose to eat three meals, five meals, two meals, one meal. Um, it, it's important that we realize that we could use our eating as a form of mindfulness and a tool to help us. So it really just helps us to slow down and be present with our food, to really come into that moment and tap into the experience of eating. So, you know, I, um, I think as a physician, we are probably the biggest offenders of just throwing food down the hatch and eating on the run. And, and when I started doing more mindful eating, I really did feel like it changed my life. So I'm excited. We're talking about this today. and We're putting this out there, not just for our patients, but for physicians as well, because I think once we put it into our own lives, we'll be able to help, you know, our colleagues as well as our world around us. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, in residency, we were the farthest away from mindful eating. You just grab whatever you can get. And I think that's true for any busy professional or anybody who is busy in their jobs uh, these days. So it's so important for people to understand what mindful eating is so hard for us to understand this concept and grasp this concept of mindfulness, because we have such fast paced lives these days. Um, It's impossible and it's impossible to comprehend uh, what mindfulness exactly is. Yeah. And and when we think about mindfulness, we think about, you know, not thinking about the past because the past can lead us to being depressed and and not, you know, focusing too much on the future because the future can make us anxious about the what ifs, but really coming into that present moment and slowing down and, you know, reminding yourself that you're safe and you're well. And as long as we have our breath, there's more right with us than wrong with us. And, and when we have our breath, we're alive and we're well. So we're able to actually make changes and do things in a little bit of a different way. And so, you know, when I sit before my meals, you know, you and I were talking the other day and I that I'm going to go mindfully eat my dinner. (laughs) I mean it. I really just sit down with my food and I come into that space and I take a deep breath because what you start to do is you shift gears. You go from that sympathetic fight or flight mode. You know, we're all kind of going through life in this way of, you know, trying to survive, right? We're in, you know, with with a pandemic, we're really 
you know, always kind of in that little spot of uncertainty and a little apprehension. So, excuse me, we just um, sit down and then go from sympathetic, that fight or flight, to parasympathetic rest and digest. And I think that that part is really important because I think all too often people are running and eating. And when you're doing that, your body is not going to digest and absorb. So, um, and how do you think this helps you in your day-to-day life? I know you do this, you consciously make an effort to practice mindfulness. How do you think it changed the way you look at your life, your health, uh, when you shifted gears to actually start incorporating mindfulness into your eating? So, you know, I myself changed my diet in 1992. So for, you know, 20, 20, what's that, 28, 29 years ago. And I truly made changes because I was wanting to try to get healthier. And then over time, I really just tweaked all the different things that I've done. And so really three or four years ago is when I started really getting into more mindful eating. And I did that because... I went to an Ayurvedic practitioner and, you know, we went through the whole consults. And one of the things she said to me is she says, you know, your diet is pristine. She said, there's really nothing I can offer you to add. And she said, but it seems like maybe you're not absorbing your nutrients as well as what you should. And I said, oh, she said, do you sit and eat at your desk and or while you're working or do you be present with your food. And I was like, Oh, well, I mean, (laughs) I eat and I'm staring at the computer screen and I'm answering messages. And I, and I thought, well, wow, that was me, you know, many years ago that I was not doing that. And I thought, well, why have this perfect diet if you're not going to absorb your nutrients? And so when you shift from that sympathetic mode into parasympathetic mode, you, you tell your body, okay, it's time to not be chased by that tiger and sympathetic, it's time to rest and digest and absorb all these nutrients. So um, I think it truly helped me. And it also reminded me that I need to slow down and go into parasympathetic several times throughout my day. So that's, that's why I started teaching this. I actually teach a program called Doctors in the Kitchen Food as Medicine. And I started teaching this to physicians in 2016. And um, we did a mindfulness exercise that we'll do today together. Great. And it was, it was really funny to, to see because you had a room full of 40 doctors and None of us practiced that. <laughs> None of us, you know. <laughs> and, and now I can only hope, you know, One of my girlfriends is a GI physician and she's like, I eat in my car in between the hospital and my office. And then I'm like running to see patients and I'm thinking we all really should just, you know, it's a way to tap into ourselves and to slow down because again, we have to eat to sustain ourselves. So I I once heard Brene Brown say it's difficult because, you know, um, eating is one of the hardest things because it's, you know, you have to do it, right? So, you know, alcoholism, you can avoid alcohol and drug addicts, you know, you can avoid the drugs, but you can't avoid food. We have to eat. And so with food, it's like opening the, ti- the cage with the tiger in it, however many times a day. And one way that we can combat that and fight back is really just going into that state of feeling more in control with our food. So I think that that part is important to know that we are in control of our fork. You know, right. and if we make a bad choice, of, you know, one time we can make a better choice the next time. So don't don't worry about that. You know, just say, OK, wipe the slate clean and start new. So, you know, I, I think for me, it really does help me to know that, OK, be present, you know, tap in. Where are you? Check yourself. Take a deep breath and just come into this moment. Don't worry about the last moment. Don't worry about the moment that's going to happen in two hours or five hours. Just what's happening in this moment and what's happening in your body right now and thinking about how that food can nourish you and fuel you, which is really what our food is supposed to be doing, right? Right. And I think uh, I think food plays a much more important role than just nourishing us because it is also a form of enjoyment. And I think being present in the moment and actually enjoying what you're eating is also very, very important. And that's what do you think true. About that? Yeah, that's true. And, you know, I I think I I do for your listeners, I do want to go through a mindful eating exercise. So I hope that you can uh, begin to think about grabbing an item that you may have 
around you. And, and, you know, if we need to pause for a moment while you grab that, you can, but, you know, starting to think about the enjoyment of the food, even, you know, you're going to tap into all of your senses. And we remember from a cultural aspect, you know, you know, you and I have spoken of this before is, you know, do you remember that meal that at your grandma's house, or do you remember that holiday with your family? So there is so much enjoyment around food, but we want to recreate that in a way that's healthy. And, and develop this healthy relationship with food. And that is when I started working as a physician with dietitians in my practice, that's the piece that I was missing as a physician is the emotional aspect associated with food, which is so powerful because it's going to be different from one person to the next. You know what you went through, maybe you came home from school and they gave you a cookie. And so cookie is love. Cookie is welcome home. But right. some people their relationship with food is very different. They, they maybe weren't given food. Uh, I have one patient in my practice, he was starved and they would only give him food certain times. So he would inhale the food as fast as he could because he would sit down and he would only have that food in front of him for a very short amount of time. And he might not get food again. So when I started digging into these relationships with food and realizing that each and every one of us are going to have a very unique relationship with food, I realized that the power is in knowing what is our relationship with food? What is our emotional connection with food? And how can we create enjoyment associated with foods that are good for us, that do fuel our body, right? Yeah, no, no, that's very true because everybody has had different experiences in the past And that kind of guides your experiences in the future. And if they've not been the greatest of the experiences in the past, they can be detrimental even in your relationship with food, for example. Yes. And what we want to do is know that we can repair that relationship with food and put you in the driver's seat of your meals, of your health care, of your life, because you are your own best healer. We, the That's doctors true. are not the healers. You are your own best healer. So what, uh, what the physicians do is give you the tools and the resources to begin to heal yourself and to begin to tap into, you know, how can we create these changes in our own bodies? And so, you know, think of your physician as your guide and wellness and self-care is so important. And, you know, your cor- your fork can either be your biggest enemy or your biggest weapon against, you know, the disease. And so I always encourage people to think about the bites and make sure that they are, you know, mattering. So, yeah. So how do you think it can help people with obesity? Well, I mean, I think the, sometimes what happens with obesity is, is I think mindless eating occurs and people aren't thinking about intuitive eating and what that food is doing. And I think mindfulness creates awareness. And so when we go to that space of creating awareness of instead of just mindlessly throwing food down the hatch, you come into that moment of what am I doing? You know, you know, just like food journaling is so helpful for people because you actually stop for a second to write it down. All those that food journal, I tell them, you know, they say, oh, I know what I eat. And, you know, no, you forget. You forget the drinks. You forget the food. You forget that. Oh, did I just eat it fast, super fast? And, you know, did I sit in front of the TV with a bag of chips and dip and, you know, just eat the whole bag? So I, I think it helps because it creates awareness of exactly what you're doing. And it gives you that moment of control, realizing that you're in control, and then slowing down a little bit and maybe not eating as much and just coming into that present moment and knowing that you can eat in a way that you're in control. You know, just like you can choose to stop at the fast food restaurant or you can have a bag of nuts in your car if you're famished to have two, two nuts, you know, to hold you over to get to home. So, you know, I mean, I always have food all around me, food in my desk drawer, food. And we talked about, you know, residency, internship, right? I I always had a protein bar of some sort or um, some nuts or something in my pocket because we were going, you know, in my call room was a banana and some peanut butter and a pomegranate juice. Uh, That's what kept me through residency because we may not get food. We had to, we had to be prepared. So you have to prepare to succeed. And, um, 
But that if we could roll into the little mindfulness piece of, of eating and what is that, I think that would be helpful to people that are around. So with me, actually, is that okay if we, we go there now? Sure, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so, so what I have, and I know where well, you can't see me, but I, I put um, a strawberry and a blueberry in a beautiful bowl. And my bowl is wooden, one of them. And then I have a separate bowl that has a blackberry and a raspberry in a little bowl that I have from Bermuda. And um, so that brings me to the enjoyment part of food. So the first thing is, is the sight of it right so put it on a pretty plate put it in a put it in a nice little bowl or go to a place of enjoyment to eat it don't just sit in front of the tv maybe go outside take your take your food and go outside with it and when I was thinking about what I was going to talk about with you all today I was thinking about maybe some of you are fortunate enough to have a blackberry bush or a strawberry bush that is nearby that you can just go to that and actually pick it right from that and, and right. then the enjoyment of that location and the sight of being in that space is going to really take you there. So then when you go back to it, you'll remember, oh, I ate that blackberry right from that bush. I remember that when I was a kid going horseback riding and picking blackberries, you know, while I was horseback riding. So so that's your site, you know, where you are around you. And then maybe I'm just going to do the blackberry to, you know, pick up your blackberry sure. or pick up whatever you have. Maybe it's a raisin. Maybe it's a grape. Maybe it's a piece of dark chocolate. Maybe that's what you want. Maybe it's that cookie. Uh, no judgment. Maybe it's maybe it's the potato chip. I mean, right. we want you to try to use your food as your medicine and there's not a lot of nutritional value in a potato chip, but, but maybe it's that. Maybe you say, but I love that potato chip. Okay, let us love that if you want to in that moment. But look cool. at that and really look and see. And then think about the life cycle. So for me, thinking about this Blackberry, where did this Blackberry come from? You know, it was grown somewhere. Somebody picked it or a machine picked it. Somebody transported it to get to the store. Somebody put it on the shelf. Somebody rung it up at the store. And then I purchased it. And then somebody delivered this to me because I had my groceries delivered. So the kindness and the love and all these people of this one little Blackberry, right, to get to me. And then looking at the Blackberry and looking at its beautiful imperfection really you know every blackberry is different just like each and every one of us is very different we right. all cannot wear the same eyeglasses right we all have a different True. prescription we all cannot like and love all these different foods we all will not have the same relationship with food but being okay with that so looking at this beautifully imperfect blue blackberry and knowing that it's okay, you know, and just kind of like looking at that and then smelling it, putting your food up to your nose. And maybe you need to kind of tap into it, like cut it open a little bit to get some smell to come out of it. And, you know, seeing what that does is, are there juices coming out of there? You know, putting it near your ear when you roll it around, does it do you hear something? Like, can you hear the sound? You know, if you grab that potato chip, which because that was your thing you wanted to grab, if you break it, do you hear that sound? Um, if you have your piece of dark chocolate as you open the wrapper, did you hear that? And what does that trigger in you? And so then what we're going to do is we're touching this and we want to remember that when we're touching this and we're moving this around, we're utilizing our sense of touch and put it up to your lips. Do you begin to salivate? Are you so excited to actually like put this in your mouth? Okay, so think about where we are in the process of this. Take a deep breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. And what that's doing is activating your vagus nerve and when you activate your vagus nerve, we've now moved from sympathetic into parasympathetic, and we're beginning that rest and digest process. 
So now I know you want to put that in your mouth and you want to eat that and you want to taste that, but now we're ready, right? We weren't ready before, but now we're ready. And go ahead and put it in your mouth, but don't bite down. Kind of roll it around. Feeling it with your tongue, feeling it with your teeth, feeling if there are any juices or anything coming out. Thinking about which teeth you want to use to bite down. And then when you bite down, close your eyes and take a deep breath and really sink in to that first bite. Thinking about the teeth that you're using. Thinking about that food. Thinking about the nourishment that it's going to provide for our bodies. And chewing 25 times. <laughs> my <laughs> husband said to me, Michelle, if I have to eat my blueberry and chew 25 times each blueberry, I'm never going to get to work. <laughs> so kind of the joke is slowing down in our house. And so, yeah, as you do that and you're chewing and I'm doing this with you, I'm, I'm eating my blackberry and I will <laughs> chew 25 times before I swallow my blackberry. So we utilized sight, we utilized taste, we utilized smell, we utilized hearing, we utilized touch, we utilized location. And we're thinking about not eating straight from the package because think about how long that process took. I mean, maybe you can, you know, add the time in here and think that that's not just down the hatch, right? That's right. really tapping into that mindfulness of your food. And we've relaxed with our food and we came into the space. Sometimes people pray before they eat or they just, maybe it's not prayer. Maybe it's just gratitude for the food. That's, that's what I do. Like I know I think about the food and the, my gratitude for having it because we're very fortunate to have it. And then taking those small bites and chewing slowly, you know, maybe coming into the space of sitting at the table, going to a meal, a family meal, taking your technology away from you because we don't. I think that's very important. Yeah. Super important. Like don't have your phone at the table. And, you know, those of us who are on call, we have to answer the phone. We do, but you don't always have to do that. We're not on call 24 seven and we should enjoy those meals with our family because coming together as a family, we're teaching our families that meals are important, that that's a connection. And we talk and we actually connect and talk over the food and the meals. And maybe one time you like pick up your fork and you eat with your opposite hand, your non-dominant hand. That's a fun (laughs) way to do it because that's going to slow you down, isn't it? Like, have you ever tried Yeah, it's a weird feeling if you, yeah, it's a weird feeling. I've tried it and it just doesn't feel right. It just feels very uneasy when you do that. Yeah, like you're kind of, (laughs) oh yeah. And I'll tell you about, first I want to tell you, like think about maybe sometimes sitting on top of your table instead of at your table. really? Yeah, think about what would it feel like to sit on the table and eat your food right? Like maybe you just do your mindful eating exercise one time. Maybe you have, you love your potato chips so much and you want to break your habit of eating so many potato chips. Um, So maybe you just say, I'm going to try to slow down this eating the whole bag and I'm just going to have one potato chip, but I'm going to eat it on top of the table as I sit here and go through this mindful eating exercise and see how that feels. Because maybe you can go from a whole bag of potato chips down to one potato chip and you can at least, you know, become more aware of why you're doing what you're doing and come into that present moment and how that that's making you feel. So, yeah, eating on top of the table and then feeling, you know, is it savory? Is it sweet? You know, thinking about those kinds of things. Don't hurry through your food. And as you're cooking your food, use that as a meditative process. You know, use that as a mindfulness, thinking about the what you're putting into it. Because those who are, when you're cooking your meals, there's love going into that, right? And I think yeah. growing up, you probably experienced that in your household when people are cooking and absolutely, yeah. serving you. There's, I mean, I still, there's, I still get a birthday meal every year for my birthday from my mom. She <laughs> makes that with love every year. Actually, I'm not sure if it's with love. It's, it may be with <laughs> like a little bit of like frustration because my, <laughs> my birthday meal favorite is eggplant Parmesan. And oh, wow. um, it's a lot of work. That's so she reminds yeah. me. She always says, "Do you really want that again, Michelle?" 
<laughs> We've tried to modify it through the years to make it healthier. I'm Italian. I grew up in an Italian family. So, of course, it, you know, it, initially eggplant parmesan had pork and it had meat and it had, right. you know, all this stuff in it that, that we have modified the heck out of um, um, <laughs> over the years. Uh, so, so maybe my mom makes that birthday meal with a little bit of love and a little bit of agitation, <laughs> but she makes it and she, she also loves to um, try to get me to eat cake every year on my birthday, which is kind of yeah. funny because I really want fruit at the end. So she makes me this beautiful fruit platter that's in a, a beautiful like format of some way. Like she goes to <laughs> interest and looks and I have beautiful photos yeah. of what my mom has done to, to make me happy with with that fruit platter, but then everybody else has cake, right? They, I said, mom, right. you gave birth to me. You should have cake. If you want cake on right. my birthday, <laughs> you go ahead. Eat that cake. <laughs> but again, even if it's that cake, mindfully eat the cake, right? So that you're not eating like two pieces of it. And if you eat cake on your birthday once a year, that's fine. But if you're eating cake at everybody's birthday and everybody's celebration, it's a lot of cake, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, the way I see it is that mindfulness is actually beneficial twofold. One is the fact that you slow it down. And we know the fact that the hormones that are released from your gut after the food reaches the gut to kind of cause the satiety, it takes time for the signals to reach the brain. So slowing down actually helps uh, because you're not going to be eating so much to feel full. And the second aspect of it is you're not always going to be hungry. There are times when you may be thirsty or you may just be bored. And just analyzing what you're feeling at that point in time and realizing why you're eating the food may actually help you in those moments when you're substituting food for something else. Right. Like, why are you eating that? And I will speak about there's actually and I don't get kicked back from this book at all. But um, Tiffany Cruikshank wrote a book called Meditate Your Weight. And it's actually not about weight at all. It's about your relationship with food and how it makes you feel. And um, I just did a conference with her on uh, yoga medicine and women's health, which was phenomenal. But her book puts you, I, I like it on audio because it talks about mindfulness in it. And then it takes you on a 21 day journey of five minutes a day of what is, you know, what is your, your relationship that day? What is, you know, is she, and you can hear her walk you through that five minutes, which to me, it's always helpful to have a guided imagery, you know, guided thought process. Cause I'm always the thinking one. Um, but the one thing when I was going through that, it hit me, I came back from a stressful meeting and said, I need a glass of wine. And I caught myself. I was like, no, you don't need that glass of wine. You need stress reduction. So go to your yoga mat instead, go do, you know, um, some meditation, some deep breathing, you know, have the glass of wine if you do it because you want it, but not because you feel like you need it. I think coming into asking yourself, what is it that I really need? What emotion am I really having? Yeah. The other aspect I think is uh, the fact that we have these associations that we make with certain foods, for example, if you're just going to be eating in front of the television, there's that association that happens. Or say if you're eating and you're watching something on your phone, that association happens with food. So that can trigger cues in your brain uh, to kind of eat and not think about the food that you're eating. And I think with mindfulness, you may be able to break that as well. And that may also help uh, you make better choices with food and the amount of food. Yes, exactly. You know, I did this and I, I, I don't want to forget to say this because it was an incredible experience, but we did the blind dining and I don't know if you've ever done that, but I have not. Oh, no, I was, wanted to actually, but I have not. Oh, well, well, I dragged my husband along with everything. So he was like, we're doing what? <laughs> and I, we were in Vancouver and actually a, a friends of ours joined us. So the four of us sat there, you could either order in advance um, or you could be surprised. And so you could be surprised vegetarian if you wanted to be, or, you know, whole food plant-based, or you could, you know, pick your meal. And so you sit down and you're served by somebody who is visually impaired and that it's pitch black in there. And the interesting thing about the experience is, is, you know, you're, you're eating with your food, your fingers, because you're, you know, True. you can't really see to like pick up your fork and to pick up your things. But when they brought the food to the table, you could smell the wine. 
you could smell soda. You could because your sight was taken completely out of it, and you wow. weren't you weren't able to um, see anything. It seriously was pitch black, and you had to call out for your server. And our server's name was Albert. So we just say Albert, and he would come running. And then, you know, like, I don't know, I, you, you really didn't know what was going on, but you used, so you used your hands to eat and then you used your, you know, like just feeling your way around to grab your drinks, to grab your food. And if you didn't know what you were eating, the surprise, they told you later oh, wow. at the end. So you were able to kind of know, like, was that curry cauliflower you know like you're because you're sitting there and you're kind of going through what is this flavor like you're really thinking about it and the other thing I noticed is is our conversation it seems so loud in there but I think it was <laughs> not really loud it was just because our sight was taken away you know so uh, things tasted much more rich our conversation was definitely better. Nobody had their technology. Nobody had their phones. Nobody was checking their watches. I actually, uh, our one friend's watch, I could see it lighting up. And I said, put that in your pocket. Like, I don't even want that <laughs> little green light from your Apple watch. Um, and then they were sharing food. They were like, you know, passing food from one person's plate to the other with their hands, like dropping oh, wow. I mean, now with COVID, we really got to be careful, but we can't be doing that. Yeah. But yeah, but I think people can still try it even at home with yeah. their family members. Wow. It's, you don't yeah. necessarily need to go to a, a restaurant to do this. Right. You can just try this with your family. And uh, yeah. I encourage people to try this because it's so fascinating. I know we are primarily, the way we are built is primarily using our sight. But once you take that out of the picture, uh, no pun intended, <laughs> right. but <laughs> you start experiencing things much better in a much different way. Absolutely. And I loved that their servers were actually visually impaired because we could talk to them about it. So they knew what we were experiencing because they go through their whole life eating without their sight. So it was very enjoyable. So, you know, grab a blindfold and try this. I think that I think that it could be fun for you. Do it at night so it's dark, you know, kind of get your plates and everything all set up and, and you know, make sure nobody has to get up and down from the table. Use glasses that aren't going to fall over and <laughs> cause a disaster. <laughs> I don't want to be the cause of that. But it, it really is something. It's an eating exercise, just like, you know, mind, it's a mindfulness exercise that you can do for fun. Yeah, and uh, you can do it at home. I, I think that's a great tip. Uh, listeners, if you're liking what you're hearing, please do hit the subscribe button and uh, so that you get notified about the latest episodes. So Michelle, are there any studies to really prove this, that mindful eating is helpful in weight loss? Yeah, there actually was one done on the effectiveness of mindfulness training and dietary regime on weight loss and obese people. And one of the things that they found is that mindfulness training really, when it was accompanied with diet, did result in weight loss in obese people. So, you know, they did, you know, they did this trial and this was actually published um, in the Journal of Medicine and Life in 2015. So you you can look that up. And so there is science to back this. And it is important that we, you know, we do all the things that we do, not just because of, you know, just doing them, but because of science. So, yeah, you know, I, I think that there's lots of articles that are out there that we can talk about. Um, but, you know, there's more to come. I think we're studying and learning every day about this because it used to, years ago when I started my food as medicine journey, it wasn't even talked about nutrition and medicine. I mean, what was that, right? I mean, right. and now it's everywhere. Now we've, we're really changing healthcare. We are. We're not just giving a pill for every ill. Just because you have hypertension doesn't mean you have to have a medicine. Just because you have diabetes doesn't mean you have, a, have to have a medicine. Um, so we're seeing that. And I, and I think there's more to come on that. So just hang tight and watch for it. And, and do these little exercises and experiments yourself under the supervision of your physician, of course, because especially if you're on medicine, one of the things that you find is that, you know, what I'm considered is a deprescribing uh, disease reversal expert. I get people off of medicine. So I take people on 27 meds and get them off. That's what I do best. That's what I love the most because I put you in the driver's seat of your health and wellness and, and make you feel better because once you remove these meds, you do feel better. But you have to do this under the supervision of your physician because, you know, you'll find that even a diabetic, if you, you will make drastic changes and come off meds very quickly, um, you want to be making sure that you're 
you're, you're doing that with your physician and with a, a lifestyle medicine physician or an obesity medicine physician or, you know, an integrative medicine physician or, or a physician who believes in food as medicine because it is powerful. Um, and a lot of times if your physician doesn't believe in this or they're not sure, um, they're willing to try with you and, you know, you prove to them that these kinds of things can happen. And we all learn as we go through life. Every day, every step of the way is a journey and we're all learning together. So I appreciate the opportunity to come and talk with you guys today. And, you know, we do put a lot of things on my website as well to help you. And I do a lot of programs um, to just educate and they're all free and for awareness. So uh, my website is um, www.bewelltherapies.org. And I have a Facebook page, Dr. Michelle Thompson. And I publish everything on there, any event that I'm going to be having. And I have a Be Well Therapies. Again, it's Be Well, T-H-E-R-A-P-I-E-S, uh, Be Well Therapies website on Facebook, rather. So two Facebook pages, as well as our website, to tell you about free programs that we have to help you. And, and again, there's never a barrier to attending anything that I do, because I think that it's important that I share this, this journey with you. Um, to put you, you know, to make you feel like you're in control and you can do this. Um, anybody can do this just because you didn't do it yesterday or didn't do it five minutes ago. doesn't mean you can't do it now. So I love to empower people to make change in their own lives. Yeah, I think that's that's very true. And the fact that you don't need to spend money for this. Yeah. You basically can start it at home. You can start yeah. it today. You can start it with your next meal. Yeah. Just eat it mindfully. Yeah. That's the that's the beauty of it. And see if it works for you. You don't need to make drastic changes. You don't need to change anything you're doing. Just start eating your next meal mindfully and see if that makes a difference for you. Right, right. You know, and they also, um, I think that it's important too to know that as you're making these shifts and you're starting to eat mindfully, you're really starting to change your body and your body's chemistry each bite you make, each, you know, each time you clench those teeth. Because, um, you know, we're learning more and more about the microbiome. And I do have some things on our YouTube channel about microbiome that are, again, free for you to watch. When I do these Zoom events, I we started recording them because people want to learn about them. And and so our um, our microbiome is important and the, the, the food that we eat changes our microbiome. So, you know, we are walking chemistry. Yeah, uh, each you know we change every day, just like water is never the same. In you know every time you step in, right. it, it's really important that we you know we go through lifestyle medicine. Right, our sleep is important, our sure. eating, our diet is important, our exercise is important, our stress management is important, our community support is important, and um, avoidance of toxins. So you know avoidance of excess alcohol and avoidance of drugs and avoidance of tobacco. Those things are important. Important. And um, again, if you didn't do it five minutes ago, you can try it now. Yeah, great. So Michelle, I'm going to put a link to your website and to your Facebook pages on my website as well so that people can reach you from there. Any parting thoughts before we close this session? Well, I think I just want to say, you know, think about your body as a machine and think about the fuel that you put in it and think about, you know, our bodies really just like our car needs antifreeze and transmission fluid and brake fluid and windshield washer fluid and all those different things, you know, think about and gasoline, right? So think about our, your body as that machine and respect your body and respect your health. You know, you only get one life and we truly are in charge of our own body and how we decide to live and take care of that. And our families watching us, our children, our friends, our colleagues. And so I think that when you realize that you are, you know, when you do have that and you want to put those right fuel and, and foods in, you know, you can't put in your windshield washer compartment, you can't put oil in there. Because what happens if you put oil in your windshield washer compartment, you try to run your windshield wipers, you know, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. You're not going to be able to see clearly. And so when you start to dump all these things like sugar and, you know, you know, highly processed foods, it, your body doesn't understand that either. And then you start having symptoms and there are 100 diseases that are associated with food. So you let food be your medicine, let food be your fuel and be empowered to make those changes in your own life. I think that's a great message. Listeners, please don't forget to drop us a review or a comment. We would really appreciate your feedback. 
If you know someone who might benefit from this podcast, please share it with them. We have many more fun episodes lined up for the future. That's all we have time for today. Thank you so much, Michelle, for sharing your insight. And thank you, everyone, for listening in. Thank you so much for having me. Yep. I'll see you all next time. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Be well. You've been listening to the Decoding Obesity Podcast. Please remember, the information in this podcast should not be used in any legal capacity whatsoever. The thoughts and opinions expressed on this podcast are solely of the host and his guests and do not constitute medical advice. Views and opinions on this show do not necessarily represent the views and opinions of any organization. And that brings us to the end of the show. Thank you so much for listening in. Don't forget to visit our website, www.decodingobesity.com for show notes and more info. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please feel free to rate, review, and subscribe on your preferred podcast listening platform. We really appreciate that effort. Until next time.